By now we've analyzed all the details of the Anita Sarkeesian debacle in excruciating detail from her humble beginnings as an event coordinator for handwriting analyst and seduction guru Bart Baggett to receiving the Ambassador Award from an emotionally and intellectually castrated Game Developers Conference board. I will, of course, continue bringing you in-depth analysis of Ambassador Sarkeesian's arguments, as well as those wonderful exposés that have her and John McIntosh going silent for days on end, only to resurface with yet another hilarious attempt to dodge responsibility for their blatantly obvious trickery. But to understand the intellectual landscape that has allowed Ambassador Sarkeesian to flourish, it's necessary to look deeper into the social justice warriors that have given birth to that most insidious of modern cliques, the hipster Puritan. For that purpose, we turn to Maddie Bryce, a so-called play critic. Miss Bryce is ambivalent at best with regards to her feelings about video games, but her Patreon campaign, which carries the subtitle Death to Video Games, elucidates her position a little more clearly and is further supported on her own website with a piece called End the Supremacy of Video Games, which asserts that the high cost of video game consoles and related tech have created a class divide and that video games are having a directly negative effect on play in general. To quote the article, I'll come out and say it. The culture around video games is strangling the wider conversation of play and games as a medium. When people say they play, don't play games, they mean video games. And it's not every kind of digital game, but the ones discussed all over enthusiast press sites. They could have just played Risk last weekend, just came from soccer practice, and be playing a match three while talking to you and still say they don't have much to do with games. It's easy to say that video games are their own thing and other people can do what they will on their own, but that's not how game ambassadors are pitching it to the world. Jane McGonigal's famous talks encourages the world to become more like video gamers to be a better place. Eric Zimmerman's vision of a lucidic, ludic century is a world where everyone is engaging play chiefly through technology. When countries confirmed games for art endowments, they mostly send funding to video game ventures. All other forms of play cling to the margins of the video games of video games when we say there's room for all. Close quote. Over the course of many articles by Miss Bryce, I found that she does indeed have a very toxic relationship with video games, one that regards both the medium and the industry as sinister and predatory. Not surprisingly, given the 2014 GDC Awards overarching theme of bowing in supplication to their own destroyers, Miss Bryce can be seen prominently in the audience on numerous occasions, not the least of which is while the soon-to-be-named Ambassador Sarkeesian is making her way to the stage. Before I begin a more thorough analysis of Ms. Bryce's ideas, beliefs, and advocacy, I want to state here and now, especially for her supporters and for Ms. Bryce herself, that this presentation, despite its cold and unsympathetic tone, is about ideas, not intimidation. By now, my regular viewers are more than aware that my videos, even those that delve into the backstories of various people, are intended to educate and enlighten, not bully and terrorize. Nevertheless, I feel that it's important to reiterate this here, as I will later. Additionally, it is important to note that Ms. Bryce is a trans person, a matter that will become relevant over the course of this analysis. I address her as Miss and use feminine pronouns as a matter of respect and courtesy, uh, and I believe that courtesy should be extended to all trans people, regardless of how seamless their transition may or may not have been. For future reference, I should point out that my patience for this only extends as far as male and female terminology, so if you're going to demand that I refer to you with some bizarre lingo that specifies your annoying emo subculture gender identity, kindly go fuck yourself, assuming you still can. A prime example of Miss Bryce's arguments can be found in her coverage of the Flappy Bird fiasco, namely the controversy surrounding creator Dong Ungayan and his decision to remove the game from the iTunes store following its unexpected popularity and the ensuing controversy surrounding his use of pipes that bore an uncanny similarity to those found in the 8-bit Super Mario Bros. 
So what is Miss Bryce's take on all of this? Well, predictably, she begins by detailing the capitalist underpinnings of the modern video game market. Like Gail Dines and other professional anti-capitalists, Maddie Bryce acts as if she's uncovered some sort of great scandal that had mysteriously eluded popular awareness. To those of us who understand how the market works and are comfortable with it, these sort of declarations are like getting excited about spreading the news that candy contains sugar or that objects in motion accelerate going downhill. She then writes, There is a price tag to participating in games. The mainstream culture of games development demands that you are from a class of people who could go into computer science or digital art training and have enough resources to handle an industry that has a terrible track record with labor issues. The standard success story of someone in games media is a person who can afford to keep up with the newest products and has the resources to write for free or low wage for about two years. Important conferences, even when you're invited to speak, often cost hundreds if not thousands of dollars to attend. Knowing that poverty and other forms of economic discrimination disproportionately affects minorities, not including anti-capitalist critique, effectively erases the struggle people face on the uneven plane we all convene upon in this community. This is why people at the top shrug at their homogeneity. They are unwilling to see the effects of capitalism on their hiring and creation practices, and even more unwilling to enact change, often with a I got mine attitude, close quote. The concept of economic discrimination is a red herring on the part of anti-capitalists. The only means by which a specific group of people can be targeted and maintained at a specific economic level is if the government gets involved, and that at that point it isn't capitalism. It's cronyism, or worse, imperialism, exactly what Ayn Rand was arguing against in Atlas Shrugged. Further arguments, such as tech programmers, assuming that's what she means by writing, have to work for free or low wages right out of the gate is unsubstantiated, as are the rest of her arguments that there's some kind of economic conspiracy to keep minorities out, Hitchens' Law. It's worth noting that, as we will see shortly, she actually deflates these very notions because she, a minority person, has autodidactically taught herself game design in a number of mediums and is regularly invited to speak at industry events such as the aforementioned Game Developers Conference. She goes on to argue that Nintendo has unjustly targeted Dong Ungayan, sort of. She talks about a great deal of harassment that Mr. Ungayan has supposedly received, but tiptoes around who is actually doing it. For example, quote, Now let's enter in Flappy Bird. For some context, Flappy Bird was a mobile game that became the focus of ire and slander because it had pipes in it similar to those in the Super Mario Bros. series, or more precisely, it was making a lot of money off of what was billed as theft. I say, I say was because it's now removed from the app store after the creator Dong Ungayan received endless harassment. Jason Schreier's article and Twitter reactions best embody how the conversation started, as you, though as you can see from some of the edits, there's been a change of tone. Robert Yang already did a great summation of what was wrong with how Jason and others handled the issue. What interests me the most is how this extreme situation exposed the capitalistic interest influence in games and the manner it ex <clears throat> and the manner it excludes and defames unfortunately this settles on what's considered a real game an obsession many people at the top of the community and industry occupy themselves with the conversation of what is and isn't a game is often intentionally or not used to assign value to already established gaming conventions that benefit the established system and marginalize works that do not look like it and therefore threaten it. Mobile games are often slated as casual games, which people in the gaming press and development overall side-eye as a genre of games mostly just looking to grab people's money, except, well, that's all of AAA games, such as the hype around how much Grand Theft Auto made despite that it was profiting off of flagrant sexism and racism. Mobile games, on the other hand, do not often pander to mainstream gaming audiences' tastes, and seeing that they go for mass appeal, obtaining fortune is always seen as a negative thing. 
Sophie Holden pointed out this contradiction in a recent conference of confluence of events. King, developer of the viral and profitable Candy Crush saga, acted in a way that is considered unsurprising for mobile developers by trying to trademark and bully other games that have the words candy and saga in them. The games community was, of course, quick to rise against the games community was, of course, quick rise against perceived soulless developers. I want to pause and emphasize here that these weird grammatical errors that keep showing up in her statements are hers, not mine. I, I, she has some serious syntax problems. But anyway, the games community was, of course, quick rise against soulless developers and protest with a game jam. But then a game makes money off of a reference maybe to a real game, Super Mario Brothers, and now it's perceived as stealing. Candy and Saga can't belong to developers, but green pipes are rightfully Nintendo's. A quick Google image search of John Blow's Braid can not only reveal that the indie darling also uses green pipes, but also uses analogs, very obvious references to Mario's enemies, mechanics, and storyline. Its entire premise is predicated on people having played Mario, yet we don't have publications saying Jonathan stole from Nintendo. These two excerpts should give you an idea of why I'm not going point by point through her article. Everything she says requires a tremendous amount of deconstruction, mostly because it's couched in empty academic jargon. I was not aware that there was any attempt to use the definition of the word game to assign value, but since most of Miss Bryce's own games are not actually games, it's relevant to establish a definition. Dictionary.com has several related definitions for game, but the most direct one is a competitive activity involving skill, chance, or endurance on the part of two or more persons who play according to a set of rules, usually for their own amusement or for that of spectators. I would hasten to add that single-player video games fit that definition because the computer running the game is the de facto other player. Miss Bryce may think she's pushing the envelope by creating games that fit none of these criteria, but really she's just not creating games. It's akin to the pretentious assholes who will bend over backwards to justify the brilliance of John Cage's piece 4 minutes 33 seconds. For those unaware, 4 minutes 33 seconds is a piece consisting of that much time during which nothing happens. That's not music, just silence. And believe it or not, 4 minutes 33 seconds has been performed live by symphony orchestra with conductor with conductors all over the world and is available for purchase on iTunes. There's even a remixes album. I am not kidding. Furthermore, there's a profound difference between similar gameplay mechanics and using a known piece of an existing game outright. Braid being a side-scrolling platform jumping game is not something that it borrows directly from the Mario franchise any more than Mario 64 borrows third-person 3D mechanics from Tomb Raider. Those mechanics are not any one person's intellectual property for the same reason that fashions cannot be copyrighted, because if that was the case, one company would own the tie, another would own pants, another would own the shirt, etc. Think of it this way. Star Wars and Alien are both movies set in outer space that deal with non-human creatures on board spaceships, but neither one is derived from the other. They have different plots, different themes, different characters, and countless other differences that make them separate ideas. If you want an example of something that could arguably be derived from Alien, think of all the movies out there about a spaceship crew that rendezvous with another vessel, ship, or planet and find all the humans dead as a result of aliens that are now running amok on the ship. For example, that's exactly the same idea that's behind Dead Space, an alien and one predates the other significantly. In the instance of the pipes, it's not just a matter of having green pipes. It's the fact that they're constructed and shaded in such a way that they bear immediate resemblance to Super Mario pipes. And that's not all. Miss Bryce chose to leave out the criticisms of the rest of the game, that the ping noise used for scoring sounds almost exactly like that of Mario and Flappy Bird. The character resembles elements of various characters from the Mario games. 
I will concede that Braid does have uh, green pipes and similar gameplay to Super Mario, but without giving any spoilers away, it is intended to satirize certain elements of the Super Mario formula, a fact that becomes apparent over the course of the game. And for the record, Mario wasn't the first platformer. Jump Bug had it beat by a number of years. But back on topic, Miss Bryce then declares that while white indie game developers are able to procure whatever elements they want from popular games because they're white, she says mostly white to weasel word around it, and that Mr. Nguyen was targeted because he was Vietnamese, uh, this unsupported assertion is asinine enough, but remember that this is all stemming from a website named with the Japanese word Kotaku, and that Super Mario and all its related licenses are owned by the Japanese, read, Asian video game company Nintendo. Add to that, Nintendo and Sony are both Japanese companies, as was Sega in its heyday, so Asian business interests have been dominating the video game landscape for most of its existence, and since Bryce already made this a race issue, that removes the possibility that she meant Vietnamese as an issue of nationality, not race. This level of paranoid assumption on her part is summarized in the closing statements of the article. Again, the grammatical errors are hers. Video games backed itself into a corner by becoming highly specialized for a very particular audience, hardcore gamers. They developed conventions, genres, marketing tactics, merchandise, PR cycles, and an entire culture that serves a very narrow idea so they could easily profit off of it. Because, because of social justice activism and outside pressure from a society that sees gaming as grotesque, awareness about how exclusionary games are is at critical mass and the industry is scrambling to answer. It has no fucking clue how to market to and include minority members of their community and in the world at large. So when Farmville, Peggle, Candy Crush, Saga, and Flappy Bird appeal to this mysterious audience, big budget and scrappy indies can't seem to tap, it's foul play. They are exploitative and unfair. But this same attitude is applied to more avant-garde work that comes up against what it means to be a real game such as Analog, A Hate Story, Problem Addict, and Dysphoria. If games that came from the general DIY movement represented a new standard, it would reveal the institution of video games to be a huge scam, a scam that exploits its workers, exploits the suffering of minorities, exploits the complicity of consumerism. For money not to affect design and coverage anymore would completely change the landscape of games, both how we interact with and speak about them. Simply dispersing the focus on the conventional game design aimed at certain kinds of players would turn their industry upside down. Be wary of any piece of critical writing and reporting that doesn't expose and interrogate how capitalism is at work. Not accounting for, the in for how the industry moves money and to whom and why it keeps us groggy as to why we have the problems that we do. We know this isn't a meritocracy, that the system values us by our monetary worth decided by its own standards. If we really wanted to move, if we really want to move forward, if we want to remove oppression and breathe life into games, we can't take the industry and throw in some brown people and queers. We have to establish a community that is inherently inclusive from the get-go, a community past capitalism. Close quote. The last statement would be better understood if it was written, a community past insert buzzword that I've arbitrarily defined as embodying everything I'm against regardless of its actual meaning. Further mind-numbing is the idea that Farmville, Peggle, and Candy Crush Saga are regarded as foul play, whatever that means. If she's asserting that comparisons to existing franchises are unfair, perhaps she'd like to acknowledge that Candy Crush Saga is almost exactly the same as Bejeweled, just with candy instead of jewels. Sure, there are some additional gameplay features, but if you took everything, if you took away everything that was exactly the same as Bejeweled, Candy Crush Saga wouldn't exist. Farmville follows in the tradition of SimCity and Harvest Moon, and Peggle, while the most original of the bunch, takes its core mechanics from Pachinko. But furthermore, how are these games considered unacceptable by the gaming industry at large? They're all readily available and free of any litigation, as far as I can tell. Oh, right. 
even though they're widely available and extremely popular and successful, the industry is still out to get them because there's game journalists that have negative opinions of them. Sorry, Miss Bryce, but one hard pill you social justice warriors are going to have to swallow somehow, some way, is that just because other people, even a whole lot of people out there, have a negative opinion of something and are expressing that opinion doesn't mean that the people referenced in their negative opinion are being persecuted in some way. Lastly, casual game is not some term of industry derision. It just refers to games that can be started and played quickly in a casual setting, as opposed to games that are rich in story and presentation and intended to command one's undivided attention. Indeed, a great many of the classic video games such as Pong, Space Invaders, and Pac-Man would all qualify as casual games along with later games like Tetris, especially in its portable incarnations. Having dispensed with some of Miss Bryce's conspiracy theories, let's turn our focus to her quote-unquote games. It's commendable in and of itself that she would take the time to actually create working examples of the kind of games that she wants to see more of, But as we will see, not only are these not games, with the possible exception of Destroy All Men, they aren't even intended for amusement and merriment. Indeed, each is an exercise in feeling ashamed of oneself. Destroy All Men could, however, be considered amusing, even though it's rather disturbing to think of it that way. Mission is, to use Miss Bryce's own explanation, a guided restaurant and bar crawl aiming to draw attention to the gentrification of the Mission District in San Francisco. She clarifies the purpose of this by saying, The Mission used to be home to many low-income Hispanic families, but now is changing due to the influx of mostly white, mostly affluent tech industry workers. And there you have it. Mission is only a series of maps that you print out and take with you while you tour different parts of the area and tally how much money you spend. This is not a game, Miss Bryce, and it is not play. This is simply an opportunity for affluent people to feel increasingly guilty about their station in life. Your only achievement here was to take something that many people like to do for fun, namely bar and restaurant hopping, and turn it into an exercise in guilt and shame. EAT, spelled with all capitals, though I'm not sure why, is more of a smack in the face than anything else. I'll let Miss Bryce explain. Quote, Everyone thinks they have the solution to your problems. What is nuanced and complicated to you is simplistic to them. They give you suggestion after suggestion, all well-intentioned, but it never seems to help you. Sometimes you snap back at them in irritation, only causing scorn and guilt. Every sound, movement, look they make seems to say, can't you try a little harder? This is my answer to that. Play this on top or instead of your day-to-day life. Think of it as trying to walk a mile in my shoes. You will actually limit your spending, emulate a part of my life, and maybe gain some sort of understanding. Follow along and see if you can try a little harder. Rules. Begin on the third Monday of either August or January. Yes, both in reality and play. Check the calendar, see below, and follow the event of the current day, if any. You start with a budget of zero dollars, not including your for your student loan. You must spend one bath and beauty B&B point in order to leave your real life house. 48 points cost $200. You begin with zero points. You must visit a university campus at least 3.5 miles away from your home for six hours every school day. Any food made, any food, mode of transportation, or other expenses must come out of this budget and cannot be carried over from before play. The budget can only be supplemented by work centered around writing and editing skills and donations. If you cannot pay your cell phone bill, you can't use your phone. If you can't pay your loans or eat for eat once for the day, you can't leave your house until you do. You must move out of your house if you can't pay your rent. Close quote. 
She then provides links to calendar and budget graphs to assist in cataloging the process. Some might be tempted to say that the purpose of this is to make us think of the needs of other people in general, but no, as the callously self-absorbed Mainichi will demonstrate, this is entirely about Maddie Bryce. Honestly, how do you think the situation you describe is at all unusual? What you're describing is a month in the lives of many, many people, yet somehow you think that you deserve special consideration, such special consideration that we all ought to suffer like you for a month to raise our awareness. Raise our awareness of what exactly? That you're a spoiled little entitlement monster? This whole thing reads less like a literal play concept and more like a loogie in the eye of anyone who won't treat your daily frustrations as the most important trials and tribulations that you that have ever existed. And a word of advice, Miss Bryce, listen to those friends of yours who see your complex problems as simple and easy to understand. The reason they're able to do that is that they're able to look at your situation objectively and see the bigger picture. That's one of the many reasons it's good to have friends, and if you are actually interested in friendship rather than sympathetic supplication, you might understand that. Blink is the most perplexing of the games in Miss Bryce's portfolio. It was designed for pulse-pounding, heart-stopping dating sim jam. Yes, that's a real thing. And, well, again, I'll defer to her own language. Quote, Blink seeks to explore how the subtle power dynamics in dating between myself and my partners. I'm sorry. Blink seeks to explore the subtle power dynamics in dating between myself and my partners and how the privilege affects our outlooks. It was also a first step in using Twine, experimenting on how to communicate systems to a player purely through text. Close quote. The description alone further confirms Miss Bryce's intention to invoke minority status for personal attention, but the game itself is utterly bizarre. Upon uploading Blink, the words Could It Be appear on the screen. Click and a brief description of Maddie on a date appears. Both persons in the situation are described as waiting to see who will blink first. If you click him, you get the message, another date. He was easily ab- able to spot her waiting for him in the restaurant. He was particularly excited about her, exotic in many ways, with a look rarely seen around these parts. She definitely had the starving artist sort of life, which is alluring in its own manner. He maneuvered through some tables before she saw you approaching. He maneuvered through some tables before he, she saw you approaching and smiled. Her name was Maddie. Close quote. Then your options are to, quote, act like a human being, act like a decent human being or blink. If you pick the former, this appears, quote, needless to say, the date went well. She was smiling even if <clears throat> she was smiling even if fumbled over a couple of lines, a couple lines. She asked if they could see each other again, a hopeful note peeking at the end of her sentences. He had some reservations, but thought seeing her again would add excitement to his life, a charge he felt missing for a while. Close quote. You can agree to another date or blink. Agree, and it says, quote, smirking, he questions why the date has to end now. At first, he thought he saw hesitation, but she quickly complied with his suggestion. He didn't think he'd be so fortunate on this date, and they headed back to his place to continue their date, close quote. Then you can blink or suggest or select Maddie blinks. If you select blink at this point, the process returns to the another date text with the narrative and the narrative begins again with the same set of options, this time with a different woman as the target of the man's interest. In what I can only assume is a blatant act of bad programming, the alternate option will still read Maddie Blinks regardless of the name of the woman now on the date. If you choose to have Maddie Blink at the outset of the process, you are treated to a lengthy description of everything that's going through her head on the course of a date that ultimately goes nowhere. The implication is clear. Everything going on in Maddie's head, or the head of whatever woman is now in the scenario, is important and crucial by default, while the man, who remains unnamed throughout, has a one-track mind towards sex that is undeterred by the success or failure of the particular date. 
this is not an exploration of anything, just a bullheaded assumption that men go around scoring whatever woman they desire and kicking women to the curb when they get what they want. Sorry to burst your bubble, Miss Bryce, but when I have a hot date coming up, I sit and talk about it with my friends, male and female, and when it's over, I sit and talk about it with my friends some more. We hyperanalyze everything that happened, wondering why she suddenly isn't returning my calls and what I could have done wrong when things were going so well, and I even walked her home and said goodnight on the doorstep like a gentleman. I sit at home and listen to This Mortal Coil and Dead Can Dance in the Dark while wondering if I'll ever be able to find love. I wonder if there was something about meeting people and dating and falling in love that everyone else learned in high school but I missed out on and now I'm too old and fat and ugly to matter to the opposite sex. I think about the time Miss Smith took me out in the hall in fourth grade and told me she'd just had lunch with the mother of a little girl I'd had a crush on and informed me that I was teasing the little girl and making other kids laugh at her. Really, it was another kid, the kind anyone who could see from a mile away was en route to being a whiny, catty homosexual in adulthood that was doing the teasing, but Miss Smith didn't care and made me write a letter of confession and apology that I delivered to the little girl shamefully. I didn't tell my parents what happened because I was still at the age where children assume all adult authority is correct authority and figured it, I would only get in more trouble. I sit and think about that incident from 20 years ago and wonder if that moment, a moment that the other two kids most likely have forgotten about completely, had somehow had some long-term effect on my subconscious that makes me fundamentally unable to relate to potential romantic partners in a confident manner. That's me before and after, mis- before and after a date, Miss Bryce, whether it goes well or not. And when the next date comes around... I have to suck it right the fuck up and do all that again. I have to be Mr. Confident, not Mr. Jittery and Nauseated. I have to push all that down into the blackened pit of my soul and show the lovely lady I'm with a good time, all while hoping she isn't one of the many who have realized that dating is just civilized prostitution and is taking advantage of it as such. And I would dare say, Miss Bryce, that most people go through similar contortions over their romantic life. The difference, however, is that I'm inclined to think of that as the unfortunate and embarrassing byproduct of a social act that I perform with the intention of having a good time, not the dramatic stage upon which to impress the world with my flagrant narcissism. In other words, talking publicly about such feelings of weakness and despair are to you a point of great personal validation, while to me it's akin to saying, hey everybody, look what I just did in my diaper. But I guess none of that matters coming from me because I'm a privileged white man, and my car is not a car but a golden throne carried on the shoulders of six loincloth-clad pygmies. What amazes me is that this is coming from the same person who had just made a game to complain about how everyone else sees her problems in an overly simplified light. Destroy All Men is a project that, again, is best summarized in Miss Bryce's own words. Quote, The Cyborg Feminist Collective have decided it was time to take over the world and have decided it was time to take over the world and finally get rid of the male scum that crawled on it. Destroy all men and list players to help their cause by dating unsuspecting men and crushing their hearts and souls when they are at their most vulnerable. Feminists have to be careful, though, because it is common knowledge that men are trying to force women to submit to the patriarchy and leave them in the dust when they are tired of them. Destroy all men is completely is completed card and board game made during Global Game Jam 2013. I was joined by Jen Aprahamian, Art and Design, and Robin Yang, Q&A Design, while acting as the lead designer. I set out, um, I set out to make a rules-light, performative dating sim that acted as social commentary. Player commentary about what? Players get to act out the many common assumptions about feminism and gender equality through this satirical game. An expansion pack of cards are soon to come. Close quote.
Yes, that's right. It's yet another opportunity for Maddie, Vi- Maddie Bryce to vent her spleen on how her difficulties in dating are part of a vast conspiracy of female oppression, even though nobody has been able to explain why exactly men would consider oppressing women so goddamn important that they would devote vast amounts of time and resources to, the, to these wild machinations. So how does it work? Well, I've spent about an hour and a half reading over the rules, and as far as I can tell, it involves writing a man's name on a heart and then moving it up and down a meter that says destroy on one end and submit on the other. Playing cards that have a positive event on them move your piece towards the winning goal of destroying a man, while the negative events move your piece towards the losing goal of submitting to a man. The positive slash destructive events are you surpass his career success. He buys you tampons. He makes you a sandwich. He watches a documentary of your choosing. He admits he's in therapy. You gain 15 pounds on purpose. He tells his mother to respect you. He gets into your favorite reality TV show. He starts working out. You tell him to find his You tell him you find his friend attractive. He considers being a stay-at-home dad. You wear yoga pants all day. He goes to a family wedding with you. He donates to Planned Parenthood. He starts doing housework. You set up a joint bank account. He doesn't want sex anymore. The inherently negative or submissive events are he moves to another city. You get married. He's cheating. You have a baby. Then there are the risk cards, events that could go either way. These are... Move in together, start working out, let him go to a strip club, wear high heels, let him watch sports with the guys, let him pay for dinner, let him choose the movie, get breast augmentation, lose weight, shave your legs, buy lingerie, wear makeup in his presence, consider quitting your job to stay home, agree to do a weird sex thing, make him a sandwich, take care of him like his mother, get pregnant, watch porn with him, hint that you want flowers, wear high heels. Well, first and foremost, things like going to strip clubs and watching TV with my friends are things that I will choose to do or not do, irrespective of your approval. You are not in a position to allow or restrict what I do as a fully grown adult, and if you don't like that, I would advise you to look elsewhere for your life partner, because you will find that I become unpleasant very quickly. Secondly, the idea that it is inherently positive for me to start working out and grooming myself well while you deliberately become a fat, unshorn tub of lard is despicable. The idea that the harpies that design this game view relationships as a battle of wills to be won and not as a mutual exchange of love and affection demonstrates just how deranged and depraved their viewpoints actually are, and seen in the context of Miss Bryce's other work, it becomes clear that the hyperbolic language used in the science fiction setup for this game is not witty satire, but rather window dressing for the truly malicious and sadistic manner in which these people view relationships. On the male side, you have John Norman, creator of the gore novels and the deluded fruitcakes over at Return of Kings, who pompously proclaimed that men who subjugate women have the moral high ground. On the female side, you have the creators of this game and women like Ellen Fine and Sherry Schneider with their rules for women's screed, advocating for the same servile subjugation for men. These people are vile and to be avoided, whatever their gender or favored gender, in relationships. They are not kinksters who delight in mutually fulfilling power exchanges between consenting partners, but the sociopathic sadists whose concept of two people in love is a tedious negotiation between humans and Cylons. Mainichi was made with RPG Maker and designed to illustrate the trials and tribulations of being Maddie Bryce as she endeavors to get dressed and walk down a city block to have coffee with a friend. If you doll her up in makeup and feminine clothing, then fewer people will stare at her and wonder if she's a man or a woman, although one asshole will hit on you then panic when he realizes you're a man, no matter what you do, and cannot and you cannot placate him, only avoid him. Fail to put on makeup and a nice dress, and people will turn and stare. Dress up appropriately, and they'll ask to play with your hair. Then you arrive at the coffee bistro to meet Maddie's friend. You have to pay for your order with either cash or a credit card. Pay cash, and nothing happens. Pay on a card, and the girl behind the counter puzzles over whether your name implies masculinity or femininity. 
Then you see an attractive barista. You can try to chat him up or take your order and go. If you chat him up, he asks you out. Then your friend asks you if he knows you're a transsexual and you're frustrated. If you don't chat him up, you're frustrated anyway. That's it. That's the entirety of Maddie Bryce's game. And finishing it only brings you back to the start to play through the same sequence of events, hence the title, which is the Japanese word for every day. If that sounds frustrating, it is and it's supposed to be. The underlying message is that this frustrating monotony is what Maddie Bryce, the beleaguered transsexual, goes through on a daily basis. There is no plot development, no artistry, uh, with the exception of the primary character the game was assembled through ready-made resources, and above all, no fun. You simply walk through this mind-numbing process until you realize that there truly was no point to any of it except to make you feel guilty about not being sensitive to the plight of Maddie Bryce. But what Miss Bryce fails to understand is that these are not problems that anyone playing the game should feel obligated to sympathize with. I am not the sort of person who is so callous as to one, get in a woman's way and hit on her as she walks down the street, or two, start screaming, that's somebody's son, when I realize she's a trans person. I'm not the sort of person that's so socially awkward that I would fumble over whether or not to call someone Mr. or Mrs. based on their androgynous name. And I'm not the sort of person who is caught up in proving his sexual identity that I would flip out if I learned that my date was a transsexual. I am none of the people that Miss Bryce apparently has to deal with every day, and so the question becomes, what do you want from me, Miss Bryce? Do you believe in some misguided way that I might somehow walk out in front of you on your way to the local coffee bistro, handing out leaflets explaining that the woman behind me is transgendered but ought not to be treated differently from anyone else? It is here that it becomes necessary to express an observation that may seem cold and heartless, but at the same time, it is precisely the argument that needs to be made. I want to clarify here and now that this opinion is not intended to be a strike against the trans community as a whole. Indeed, there are many trans women, such as those like uh, porn stars Vanity, Bailey J, and B. Armitage, who I will say without hesitation are absolutely beautiful and pass seamlessly for natural women. I further go on to emphasize that Jennifer Lydum, though not someone I'm attracted to, does pass as a woman with flying colors and is one of the greatest jazz bassists of all time. Additionally, this should not be construed as an attempt to cyberbully Miss Bryce or to advocate for others to do so. It is merely a series of blunt observations that are relevant to the topic and that were made relevant to the topic by Miss Bryce herself. With that said, the simple reality is that Maddie Bryce has not transitioned well. When she stands in the GDC video, we can see that she's very tall and that she has a very masculine build. This alone makes it difficult for her to transition, but it's only the tip of the iceberg. She has a very strong masculine jawline and cheekbones. Add to that her hairstyle, the proverbial fro, is common to men and women. Without overtly obvious gender clarifiers, such as traditionally feminine clothing and makeup, it's reasonable that the casual observer would be befuddled, but that's only compacted by the fact that Miss Bryce chose an androgynous first name. I don't think it's unreasonable to guess that she was Matthew prior to the transition, but if her credit card read, Mary Beth Ann Allison Bryce, then it's far more likely that the cashier wouldn't have been so confused. Why do I bring this up? Because the underlying message of this game seems to be that Miss Bryce's most profound life choices are everyone else's responsibility. Earlier, I mentioned Jennifer Lydum. Prior to her transition, she was John Lydum, one of the most in-demand jazz bassists alive and universally recognized as a master of the instrument. After her transition, her phone stopped ringing as often and the studio and concert gigs began to dry up, underscoring a profound streak of unaddressed transphobia in the jazz community. Jazz publications like Jazz Times continued to feature her prominently, helping to restore her public image and, to some extent, her career. Thankfully, she was surrounded by high-profile colleagues that cared only about her musical ability, not her gender, and has been able to continue working because of it. Why am I sympathetic to Jennifer and not Maddie? Because Jennifer's career suffered as a result of an issue that should have been completely 100% irrelevant to her ability as a musician. Maddie's career, on the other hand, is suffering. 
She has made a career out of victimhood in what is perhaps the ultimate show of ingratitude to the civil rights leaders of the past that actually fought to improve the lot of people like her. She has no content to her work other than vacant boilerplate social justice warrior arguments designed not to enlighten but to shame and guilt into submission. Miss Bryce, I do not sympathize with your day-to-day struggles because I do not recognize them as anything special. Do you think you're the only person who struggles with their appearance or is dissatisfied with what nature gave them to work with? Do you think your petty day-to-day aggravations are somehow more important? Let me tell you something, Maddie. I go to gym, I go to the gym at 1 in the morning so that I won't look like a 6 foot 2 inch tall potato next to all of the beautiful people. I swim at the pool at odd hours for the same reason. And I don't even bother flirting with the barista assuming it's a girl because I assume out front that she wouldn't be interested just like I assume that all women aren't interested because it's easier to deal with that than a steady stream of rejection interspersed with occasional dates that go nowhere. And when I play shows with my band and girls come up to me afterwards, it just makes me irritable because I feel like they're interested in the guy in the band, not me personally. Does that sound sad and painful? It is. But unlike you, I realized a long time ago that it's not the job of the world to somehow throw me a big old pity party. I realized that pain is a part of life, and I agreed with Nietzsche that it's necessary and important as a part of life because it's in response to pain, suffering, and conflict, and frustration that we learn who we truly are. It is not what we it is not that we encounter pain and frustration but how we deal with it that matters. My response is to be undefeated and continue to work to make something of my life that is worthy of celebration. Your response is to demand that you be celebrated for being defeated. The only thing that allows you to take this position, Miss Bryce, is that you are a racist and a sexist. As a racist, you claim special consideration for your day-to-day struggles based on being an ethnic minority, and as a sexist, you claim additional special consideration for your gender. You take advantage of the fact that our modern society is understandably sympathetic to the suffering of minorities given their oppression in our recent history, and you leverage that into a career of flamboyantly mealy-mouthed failure that is celebrated by vast throngs of supporters who apparently think adhering to your shame-laden diatribes will assuage their liberal guilt and make them intellectuals by default. I have no such recourse, Miss Bryce. Were I to try to fall back on my race and gender, I would immediately be subject to the kind of ostracizing that you should encounter as well. Look at the phony intellectuals like Jared Taylor and his cohorts at American Renaissance. Your sort belongs in the same dumpster of contemporary disregard, not seated prominently at the Game Developers' Choice Awards. It's illogical for any person to be either proud or ashamed of their race or gender. They did not choose or achieve these things. Therefore, it is an irrational source of any understanding of oneself. But you, Miss Bryce, have chosen to change your gender. This, in and of itself, could be considered a source of pride. You did work to achieve this transition in your life. But you have no concept of pride. Your concept of pride exists only in the collective, and having only a collectivist understanding of existence, you can only experience secondhand virtues. Instead of pride in oneself, you substitute the paltry sense of entitlement that all the world should feel guilty and ashamed on your behalf. Such is the nature of an individual whose sole source of value is the collective, and such is the nature of your creative output. Miss Bryce has amassed nearly $800 per article in her Patreon campaign from a host of donors who apparently flock to be yoked by the same shame and degradation bestowed on them, just like a congregation that showers a preacher with cash rewards after a sermon on what horrible, vile sinners they all are. This sort of ecclesiastical masochism would be harmless were it not so were it not stridently encroaching on all creative endeavor and all artistic output. Such is the insipid nature of hipster puritanism. These fools who flock to the outer edge simply for the recognition of being on the outer edge are all too happy to be the financiers of their own destroyers and use their smug sense of disdain as a smokescreen to protect them from the truth and reality of their actions and from recognizing as legitimate any observation which deflates their stuck-up sense of entitlement. 
this cancer, which masquerades as insightful commentary, is a far greater threat than anything the censors of the world could dream up. Indeed, creative people are most often galvanized by status censorship and produce astounding work. That is why scumbags like Jack Thompson get booed off the stage. Their intention of censorship is obvious and well known. But the hipster Puritan agenda is far more cunning. It slithers into the creative mind as a welcome supporter, and as the saying goes, you must first get behind somebody if you wish to stab them in the back. Then it whispers in the ears of the populace about progress and social responsibility in the populace with Pavlovian devotion. Here's words that it has been trained to think of as good and supports this forked tongue automatically and uncritically. The creative is then faced with an ultimatum. Surrender to the politically correct demands of the unthinking herd or be cast down into the inferno of public disdain as a bigot, a chauvinist, a racist, a sexist, backwards-thinking, conservative, reactionary, a misogynist, an oppressor, a narrow-minded traditionalist that won't think outside the box, etc., etc. And when the creative surrenders, as they are so doing... Their work goes from being the beautiful, lush, pristine outgrowth of their own individual minds and instead becomes a mouthpiece for the latest incarnation of the fire and brimstone traffickers of guilt and shame. Do not be fooled by Maddie Bryce. She is not forging new ground, just rendering sterile the ground that was already fertile. She is, by her own definition, a play critic, and a critical look at her own work reveals just what she means by that. Play is a thing of merriment and happiness, a source of fun and personal joy. These personal fulfillments are things that a collectivist like Miss Bryce looks at with scorn and indignation. How dare they play and enjoy themselves? How dare they look at their free time, or indeed their very lives, as their own? How dare they ever forget, even for the few minutes it takes to play a game of Donkey Kong, that their purpose is to stagger forever under the boulder of shame? the shame they ought to feel for existing. Do not mistake the advocacy done by those like Miss Bryce as a love for humanity. It is quite the opposite. It is the greatest and most unadulterated degree of misanthropy that is possible to the human race, the belief that life is not to be enjoyed but endured, that pain is not meant to be overcome but prolonged. And a word of advice to Miss Bryce and other gaming industry transsexuals such as the once admirable Caroline Pettit, Look closely at the feminists. They aren't your friends. Gloria Steinem famously wrote that transsexuals mutilate their bodies to conform to stereotypical gender roles and that feminists should rightly be uncomfortable about transsexualism. Her famous quote on the matter was, If the shoe doesn't fit, must we change the foot? Then there's Janice Raymond, who said that transsexualism was men's attempt to colonize feminist identification, culture, politics, and sexuality, and in a blunt display of bigotry and hysterical delusion declared, all transsexuals rape women's bodies by reducing the real female form to an artifact, appropriating this body for themselves. Transsexuals merely cut off the most obvious means of invading women so that they seem non-invasive. And don't forget Sheila Jeffries, who famously declared transsexualism to be a human rights violation. But perhaps most damning is Julie Bindle, Gail Dine's current collaborator, who wrote the Guardian article, Gender Benders Beware, in which she claimed that men had the right to dispose of their genitals, but that it didn't make them women. This was accompanied by a cartoon that was so revolting that it leaves no doubt as to Bindle's bigoted viewpoint. Lastly, I'll advise you to peruse radicalhubarchives.wordpress.com for one hate-mongering diatribe after another about transsexuals. But of course, that doesn't stop feminists from appropriating the plight of trans persons when it suits their agenda. Just like the feminists were more than happy to declare Manvember, the Men's Health Month campaign, to be transphobic when they needed a reason to speak out against it, so the Anita Sarkeesians of the world are happy to leech onto trans women in the gaming industry and exploit transphobia by dressing it up as a branch of their own agenda. Time and again, when Carolyn Pettit posts on Twitter in support of Feminist Frequency, I've reminded her that they're just using her. She doesn't seem to get it, but I hope one day she does. She used to be one of my favorite gaming critics, and I even went so far as to say that she could have been the game industry's Roger Ebert. But then she became a social justice warrior. For God's sakes, Caroline, don't sink to the level of Maddie Bryce. 
Unlike her, you actually had something of value to say outside the world of professional victimhood. The hipster Puritan stands as the most insidious and revolting form of political correctness. Those who vacantly seek out the edge for the sake of being on the edge and use the morality of abstinence, temperance, guilt, and shame to get there. They are not bold pioneers of a new level of creativity, but rather the parasites that feed off the creative work of the productive, saddling it with an increasingly heavy burden of demands. Those demands reduce adventure gaming from the lavish, surreal, dreamlike worlds of mist to the pointless wondering of gone home. Those demands reduce RPGs from the beautiful, immersive futurisms of Final Fantasy to the agonizing frustration exercise that is Mainichi. And those demands reduce Neil Druckmann, creator of The Last of Us, a game that truly did move video gaming onto higher ground, to the humiliating task of shame of standing shamefaced before his peers and handing the GDC Ambassador Award to a con artist charlatan that has done nothing for games, game developers, and gaming culture except shivy them into submission to condescending political correctness. The narrative of history is being written as we speak, and as the saying so often goes, when the legend becomes fact, print the legend. This is where we, the truth seekers, are at a disadvantage, for we are advocates of the truth, while the social justice warriors are advocates of the legend, and sadly, the legend becomes legend because it's what people want to hear. It makes for a good movie. It makes for good reading. The hipster Puritans have placed themselves in the lofty position of writing their own legend and handing it down to the beleaguered journalists that will give it validation. When a movie is made about this point in time, what will the story be? Will it be the story of how tirelessly working, muckraking journalists unearthed the truth about the frauds and scammers that were strangling an industry with their parasitic demands? Or will it be the story of how a few beleaguered underdogs stood up to the bigoted, racist, sexist, misogynist game industry whilst withering the slings and arrows of online harassment to secure their right to, oh, golly gee, just be a part of this neat thing that everybody else was excluding them from even though nobody actually was? Over a thousand years ago, the peddlers of fear prevailed in Rome, and the result was the Dark Ages. They prevailed again in the 1930s, and the result was the Holocaust. They prevailed in China and Russia, and the result was Mao and Stalin. They prevailed in Italy, and the result was Mussolini. They prevailed in Spain, and the result was Franco. They prevailed in Korea, and the result was North Korea. They prevailed in the United States, and the result was McCarthyism, the Ku Klux Klan, the Department of Homeland Security, the war in Iraq, the Guantanamo Bay, and every other erosion of personal liberty. Just as the disturbing images of the living corpses that are addicted to brutal drugs like crocodile are not enough to inspire users to get clean, so no amount of side effects from the drug of irrational fear will inspire the human race to kick the habit. That is what leads them to bow in cowardly servitude to the whims of Ambassador Sarkeesian, and that is what we face in this eternal campaign to have the truth etched into the stone of history. We, the ones who declare these hipster Puritans to be charlatans and are pilloried by the masses, are the spiritual successors to the first cave dwellers who dared to walk out into open fields during a storm and come back declaring that thunder and lightning were not instruments of an enraged God, but merely a part of nature, only to be burned at the stake or crucified for their bravery. To reach that ultimate goal, the Valhalla that will be our age of reason, we must be ever ready to battle the smug fools and malicious hucksters of unreason. May your hearing of my words be another small victory won in that long and arduous campaign. If you would like to experience artistry that is undiluted by the whims and agenda of the hipster Puritans, then I invite you to try my science fiction fantasy web series, The Vessel Chronicles, or my anthology series, Dark Therapy, as well as check out my band, Leaving Babylon. If you're so inclined, donations to support my video projects as well as my larger artistic goals are greatly appreciated and can be donated via patreon.com slash jordanowen42. Thank you for your time.